Straw Hut Media. Thank you for being Boulevard. Life is a banquet, and most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy, buttons and bows and pantyhose. On the Rocks podcast, the place where we're too glam to give a damn. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at On The Rocks On Air and on Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email, book me for a pride, wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris, I don't care, I'll show up. Info at ontherocksradioshow.com. Send us your comments, your guest questions, and your guest request. Uh, the show's presented by Strawhead Media. You can watch and or listen to our now over 350 episodes at ontherocksradioshow.com for free. You can also watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the Outit.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Hello, East Coast. Host. We proudly tape at UBN Go Studios, your one-stop place for all forms of podcasting. All right, let's get the show on the road because we have a legend in the studio today. I am so, so excited listening to her music with my mom as a kid. Um, and I can't believe she's actually here in Los Angeles. So we snagged her up real fast. Uh, <laughs> Yvonne Elliman. American singer, songwriter, actress who performed for four years on the first cast of the stage musical Jesus Christ Superstar. She had her first Billboard Hot 100 hit single in 1971 with the ballad, I Don't Know How to Love Him. Um, and she scored a number of hits in the 70s and achieved a U.S. number one hit with If I Can't Have You. She's collaborated with the Bee Gees, toured with Eric Clapton, and she has continued performing at music festivals, benefits, and concerts throughout the country and around the world. Currently, she and Jesus Christ Superstar film lead Ted Neely are touring parts of the U.S with concerts and special screenings. Please welcome Yvonne. <laughs> you know, yeah, first, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Let's get my name straight. It's Element, like L-M-N-O-P. Element. Element. Yeah, didn't they say that? Element, I thought you said Edelman. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> it's the vodka. It's kicking already. <laughs> That's how we do it at All The Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to get right down to it because you have to go sign autographs for hours and hours. Yeah. So we're going to get you pumped before you do that. Thank you. Um, you hail from Hawaii. You have uh, Japanese and Irish descent. No. No. <laughs> no, not Irish. We're just setting the record straight left <laughs> and right here. No, I'm no, half Japanese, half. Well, I don't know because my dad was left in a shoebox on, on someone's doorstep uh, as a preemie, just fresh born out of, the, out of the womb. And he was left on a doorstep. And I didn't find out until I was 60. So... For all this time, I thought my grandma was from France, and uh, and that she was had had a ticket on the Titanic to come over. But her uh, her neighborhood gave them all a, a going away party, and so they decided to sell their tickets. Oh my! God. And so and so I thought all these years, oh, I wouldn't be here if my grandma had gotten on the Titanic. Yeah. But then I found out at sixty, that's not my grandma. Oh. <laughs> That's a movie in itself. Where's yeah. that movie? You better call Andrew Lloyd Webber and say, we've got another musical in us. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I had a 23 Me done, and apparently I'm just Northern European, a little bit of Polish, a little bit of Norwegian, a little bit of uh, of, of, of Irish. There's a little Irish in there is. There is a little so, Irish. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what are you talking about? Of course there is. <laughs> um, but you got into music so early, at a very early age. You just picked up all these instruments. Was music in the family, or how did how did the musical bug bite you? No, um, my dad was uh, he was a lefty, right? He was the one that was left on the doorstep, oh. and um, the they his mom who who found him on the doorstep she she adopted him, uh, but they didn't like lefties because they didn't believe in that. You know, I don't know why. There's some kind of weird superstition that went along with it, but. Um, they tied his hand behind his back and they whacked it with a stick. That's related to my mom because <laughs> yeah. she was left-handed. I'm I'm left-handed. I am too. Yeah, but oh my it was gosh. considered bad luck. But now we know that we're geniuses. Yes, like, absolutely. That's, the scientific, that's come from it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Oprah Winfrey. Now, I think she sent a yeah. doctor out into the world. Yeah. And when he came back, uh, he because she, she wanted him to go and investigate. Yeah. And he came back and said that lefties are more intelligent, yeah. basically because we have to adapt. To, to situations. Yep. We have to think on our feet, you know. Exactly. And so here we are, two two geniuses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah, he he I think he he always wanted to sing, but because I think he was rewired weird. Yeah. You know, um he vicariously sang through me. Mm -hmm. And so he was the man who was behind everything I did. He got me the piano lessons. He'd sent me to charm school. You know, he sent me to secretarial school in case the music didn't turn out well. <laughs> and uh, uh, he was he was the manager of my first band in Hawaii, and and uh, I had a, a folk band. And f through that band, my teacher, 
uh, who was from England. <clears throat> he taught band orchestra and world history. He took a tape of mine back to England at Easter vacation time, and they um, see, he, he played it for an agent named Morris King. And Morris said, bring her back here after she graduates, and we'll make yeah. her a star. And so he took me after, the day after I graduated, and I was a very bad student. I was an F student. But he got all my teachers together. He said, you have to pass her. You've got to get her Ds because she's going to be here and just wasted. You know? And so uh, as soon as I graduated, two weeks later, I was on my way to England, and uh, that's where I uh, got discovered. <laughs> well, and I did hear that you had some school issues, but they, they decided to, to, to let you go. But what is a kid doing running around London? I mean, you were so young. Well, thank, thank goodness I had a family that was, uh, that, that it was a financier. He backed me. He gave me five pound a week spending money. But, you know, I, would, I didn't have anywhere to sing. So I'd take a bearskin rug, rug and I'd go down to Piccadilly Circus, put it down, and I would just play because I loved I had my guitar with me. And I played, 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 and I sang. And then some guy came up to me and said, Oi, where's your hat? Put out the hat. You can make some money. And so put out the hat. And all the shillings were flying into this hat, you know. <laughs> and we had enough to go buy our weed for the night. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I had, I had a great time doing that. But uh, somebody, you know, eventually somebody saw me at ISO's restaurant and she said, bring me over here. I think that lady's very interesting. I walked over to her and um, I, I guess I walked kind of funny because in Hawaii you don't wear a lot of shoes, right, honey? Yeah, I don't wear a lot of shoes. And she said, why do you walk like a duck? <laughs> so I just, I, I've, I've got to do something to change that. So she had a lady come over and put me in, in jersey silks bought me some good shoes. And uh, yeah, I was walking down in Soho with my bare feet and this this old geezer comes up to me and says, Oi, put on some shoes down. You get syphilis, you know? So well, that London. scared the, yeah. Yeah, it scared <laughs> the heck out of me. And so uh, I started wearing shoes, but that's why I walked funny. So anyway, but, she got me into, into a club where I was finally discovered. But um, yeah, it was about six, seven months I was there just tooling around, you know? I mean, that's so dangerous, like in my mind. And culture shock on top of that. Absolutely. Not just a different state, but a different oh, country. I was so homesick, my goodness. The first song I wrote was was called Hawaii. And um, and it's a beautiful song, but I was totally heartfelt. And I was very homesick because it was it was winter. I was not used to this. Um, yeah, and I missed, my, I missed my boyfriend and I missed my mom and dad. My dad said to go. And you know, he said, you go. And my mom was like, please stay with me. I need, I'm an only child, you know. Yeah. <sighs> I'm so glad my dad said go. I wanted to go where the Beatles were. And and uh, and I did eventually get to meet them, but that's that's another story. I got to play with George Harrison all night. Get at, out! Yeah, at Eric Clapton's house. Yeah, we were the we were the last ones in this in this music room, and we were singing some sort of Indian mantra. And the sun rose. And that's I was, amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I can carry on with that story later if you want to ask me about it. But well, it's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Well, and like the Eric Clapton ears, because uh, Bob Dylan said, "I'm talking fast because you talk fast. I don't usually talk this fast." <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep up with you here. <laughs> um, but you, you were involved in, in the club and, and the bar scene in, in, in London. Mm. Um, and we know it's kind of disco era, but your your love was really rock. I love, yeah. Yeah, my, my idols were, were Clapton Cream, Led Zeppelin, Santana. You know, it was that Crosby, Sills, Nash & Young. It was along those lines. And so when <laughs> I was playing at this, it's a, the Pheasantry Club, which is a kind of a has-been actors club. That's what I was told later on. I, I, I didn't think it at the time, but there was a guy named John Hendricks was, who was supposed to be mm -hmm. heading, you know, Hendrix, Lambert, and Ross, who was a jazz band. And he didn't show up, and so the own, owner came to me and said, Vaughn, you've got to do everything you know, because I just came in in between, you know, like 10 minute sets. Yeah. And so uh, I did everything I knew, from where have all the flowers gone to, can't find my way home and you know for what it's worth and I just did everything I knew and I was so happy with that I was so happy to be able to sing for an extended period of time and have people really like me and then Andrew came running up to me he looked like Beethoven he was like hair all springing out everywhere he never did and learn he, how to brush his hair no he didn't, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't and he said you're my Mary Magdalene like that and I said who's that you know he said well I got this this thing called Jesus Christ Superstar and Talked as quickly as you did, and he said, uh, "He said, but when he said record an album, I my ears just perked up because that was my goal at the time, and that was to see my my. Do you know that's so weird? You look at a vinyl record, and you see the little squiggly lines, and that represents your voice. Yeah. And I just wondered, how did they do that? Do you know to this day? Isn't it? I mean, we really don't. It's, I don't know how radio waves go through the yeah. air and, and get to our our radio. You don't know? Aren't you curious?" I don't want to ruin the science of it. I just want to be yeah, mi me too. mystified. Like, but I'm it a... is amazing. Like, And it's around forever. Like, Yes. You're immortalized. What do you mean? 
Like that record will be around. Oh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm talking about yeah. the radio waves getting going through the air and reaching your house. Yeah. I mean, that is like, freak, that's amazing. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to see. That's the goal at the time to see those little those little squiggly lines represent my voice. So I was, soon I as soon as I heard, I'm going to slow down, okay? As soon as I heard <laughs> you're going to record an album, I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. So he in, in, invited me to his home. He sat down at his grand piano and he said, I want you to do this song. And he played, I don't know how to love him. And uh, I thought, well, that's beautiful, but why would a mom be singing that to her son? And he said, that's not the mother, that's the whore. <laughs> <laughs> I went, what? And then he explained to me who Mary Magdalene was. And that was very interesting. It was more colorful. This was, I mean, I grew up half, you know, Buddhist, Christian, but not practicing. Right. And so all I knew was the nativity scene. And so that's why, that's the only Mary I knew, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so when I, I heard that this was Mary Magdalene, I started to read up on her. And I thought, geez, how do you, how do you sing that? But when I went to the studio, they said, just sing it, just sing it, how you, how you feel it. And so I closed my eyes and I sang how I always sing, which is with feeling because you- and pathos, your you voice has so to, much pathos. Mm, well, you, they, I heard it was the plaintive cry. Yeah. <laughs> no, all, all this emotion. I remember the first time my mom played uh, one of your records, it was just this emotion. And I was a little kid, you know, and you just have this quality to your voice that sets you so far apart. What is, I always ask people, what is it? Because I don't know. You know, I can't really it's figure it out. It's this temper and it's this sorrow, but it's... it's oh, does it, it sound... It sounds sad and pleading? I mean... I, I, as it should, you know. Yeah. Um, but Thank you. Yeah. But so effective. I mean, I, I listen to you all the time. Did you sing along with me? Yeah, of course I really? did. And then your your new song with uh, Ted Neely. Oh. Yep. Up Where We Belong. Oh, Up Where We Belong. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, that's hard to do. Jennifer Warren's, you know, and Joe Cocker. Mm. Yeah, hard she, to do. Yeah. But yeah, but we try. We yeah. try. I mean, I don't believe in doing a song unless you can do it better. Right. You know, so, um, but at the show we're doing in Boston, uh, we're doing songs I've never done before, done, never done before, but they're giving me this, uh, Frank, Frank Munoz, by the way, is the man that's putting all this together. And he said, we're going to do, I can't explain. I never did that on stage. We're going to do Savannah. <laughs> what? You know? And so I was told, get, get it ready. And I did. And it's the best feeling to do, mm -hmm. to do songs that I, I recorded, but I've never done. And um, they turned out great. It's going to be a great show, by the way. I'm so dry. Can I have a little drink? Yeah, of course. It's just, just regular. I mean, you gave me a very strong one, by the way. I did? <laughs> <laughs> I made it very weak. <laughs> I don't know. And there's some mm. water there. What is this here? Oh, oh, that's the other water. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but let's go Wait, back to, to, to meeting Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this guy says he has an album called Jesus Christ Superstar. What was your thought? Because that sounds ridiculous. Strange. Right? It did. It yeah. did. As soon as I heard Jesus Christ, I went, ooh. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know? I, I wasn't sure. But just because of the whole recording factor, that's why I wanted to do it. And uh, when I heard the song, then it was like, wow, that's very pretty. And then so I did it. One take. Boom. I, was, I heard you did it yeah, in one, one take. Yeah, one take. And they, they, I sang it and they looked at each other. They said, how is that for you? That was great. Great. Okay. That's it. And so then I did Everything's All Right. And that was another thing. Um, uh, and made by the fire. Yeah, I think that was another day. But so I did this recording, and I didn't think anything more about right. it. Really, I had I had my goal was finished. I, you know, I, I would see that eventually on a record. And then I was called into their office, uh, and I was asked to. Uh, yeah, this is a funny thing. The guy that said uh, for me to go over, bring her over when she graduates. His name was Morris King, and you know, nice Jewish man. When he spoke, the peanuts flew out of his mouth. You know? <laughs> He had spit all over the place, you know. And so he said, uh, when I got there, he said, we're going to have to change your name, darling, you know, because it's a little too ethnic. He thought Elliman was too ethnic. So, and this is Morris King talking to you, yeah. you know what I mean? And so they changed it to uh, Kim Shane. Kim Shane being the, the, the Asian side, right, because Kim Chi, right, Kim. And then the Shane part, because Alan Ladd did a movie called Shane, and that's the, that's the Howley Caucasian side. And so I was Kim Shane for a little while, and... And so I dressed in, you know, fringe and, and way too heavy eye makeup. And uh, I didn't like it. No. It didn't fit me. I didn't, but I always thought Yvonne Eldon was, was not a very stage name, you know. I thought it just wasn't, it didn't sound like all the other names that I'd heard. But um, apparently it's okay. It's okay <laughs> to stay with your name, right? <laughs> Even Engelbert Humperdinck stayed with his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, So yeah. this record of Jesus Christ Superstar comes out and then... It takes years of your life. Like you are involved in this Completely. musical for years Completely. and years. Yes, yes. Well, not years. 
kind of uh, months, actually, because I was told Robert Stig would call me into his office, this great ground place, a huge sea. I mean, I mean, the ceiling was so tall and lots of, I thought, have gone with the wind immediately because mm. of all the curtains, you know. And uh, anyway, he said, we're going to have this this row show we would like you to do it and uh we're paying you this much and it was a huge amount of money well first of all I, I was offered the royalties you know and um tim rice called me in and andrew was there and they said listen to this would you would you listen to it and i had a manageress who was this lovely woman who discovered me at iso she's the one that said i look like a duck and, and dressed me and so she, she was there with me and so uh we listened to a little bit of it she said darling it's a piece of shit that was fresh because they had five 20 pound notes spread on the table right in front of us. And they said, you can have this or you can have a half of 1%, which was a lot if you think about it now. Oh, yes. You know, but it sounded like a little bit half of 1%, you know, it sounded like I was not good at math. I'm a lefty, you know, it didn't make. <laughs> so uh, she said, it's a piece of shit, honey. Uh, let's just take the money. I said, Okay, we're going to take the money, you know. And so we took the money and we went to the wine store. We bought a case of Matus Rosé and uh, a bunch of steaks. And we had a, a party on our roof because we lived in a small little flat. And Britt Eklund came over. And so some, you know, she knew some high-powered people yeah. because her husband was Al, um, was Al, Al Letieri, who was Salazzo, Salazzo in Godfather. Oh, the guy that had the night yeah. Put, yeah, him. And so I met Marlon Brando. I met Peter Sellers. I met all these people. That's insane. In fact, Peter Sellers was at her, was at her party one night, and he smoked too much weed. <laughs> <laughs> he was lying down. He was lying down. And he said, oh, my God, my heart. My heart my heart feels really funny. And so she said, darling, would you go in and talk to him? You're Hawaiian, you know. Go in and talk to him. Make him feel better. <laughs> Calm him down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went and I sat there and talked to him. I go, Peter, everything's fine, honey. You know, just flow with it, babe. You know, just kind of feel how it makes you feel. And he started to feel better. He said, ah. That feels better, you know. So then he left and he called her up. He said, I like her. I'd like to take her out on a little date, you know. So <laughs> he picked me up and, and took me in his um, his Shelby Mustang 500. And I sat in this car. We went up and down Park Lane. He just sped up and down Park Lane. Vroom, vroom. I thought, wow, that's great, you know. And, and so then he said, let's go up to my flat, you know. So we went up to this place and he put up this screen, you know, projection screen. And he started to play Dr. Strangelove for me on it. And he stood next to the screen. He started to do the d -d 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 thing, you know, you know. <laughs> All that stuff. And I said, oh, that's, that's kind of funny, you know. But I, he had a daughter, and she was playing with her Barbie dolls. And I was much more interested in that, you know, <laughs> being 17 years old. You know? So I started to play with her. I just talked to her. And he was going hur, 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 in front of the thing. And I didn't pay attention. He went, put away, finally put away the screen. He said, took me home. And he told my friend, he said, she's a little too young, you know. He kissed me on the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyways, so she. Um, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> no, so you were talking about you know going from album to it being this huge stage production that, that you were with, and then opening on Broadway. This little girl from Hawaii yeah. being a Broadway star overnight oh. because you didn't have any like theater experience. Not at all. I went on the on the concert tour and we did a couple of weeks, and I got kind of got my teeth you know cut a little bit, but. They said we're starting the uh, auditions for Broadway, and I and I went there and I did the song. I don't know if I had much Wait, competition. They made you audition? I I did. I don't know if I had any competition. I didn't see anybody else, but I mean it was kind of because I sounded like the record, yeah. and I, I you know that was the voice that people would recognize. It was a hit. I got the I got the job, and having never done anything that way, I was really you know I was really wet behind the ears. What does that mean anyway? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when you're newly born, you're wet behind the ears? I don't think so. No? That doesn't sound okay. right to me. No? Okay. <laughs> but if anybody knows, would you call in, yeah. please, and <laughs> tell us what that means. So, uh, uh, yeah, we did. We, we did, The show opened, and I had my own dressing room, and my parents came from Hawaii, and we fancied it up with a rug, and I. but nobody came into my room. I felt slightly ostracized because everybody in there had been pounding the sidewalks for years, yeah. trying to get, the, you know, and trying to get good, good parts. Yeah, and so I think they kind of looked at me like, how the heck? Well, they had to understand. I sang the record, so, you know. But Ben Vereen took me in his his room, and he read the Bible to me, and, and he tried to, you know, I don't know what he was doing with that. But um, he, he, he befriended me, and that was very sweet. Um, so one night I just thought, you know, my understudy, she – she was a real sweet girl, but I, I hardly said two words to her. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sick. I'm going to be sick. So you can do the Just role. to give her a chance. Yeah. And so I put a 
big black cloak on, and I and I wanted to see the show anyway. What it looked like, it was phenomenal. I mean, the set design was incredible. Ah, uh, and so when they say the role of Mary Magdalene tonight will not be played by Yvonne, Lund, and the whole audience went, ugh. <laughs> yeah, there was a real big, big ooh, and I felt bad. And although I watched the show, and she was wonderful, she did great. And after that, they treated me great. I was, you know, I had pals all over the place, and I stayed there for six months. Um, I remember going to the Phil Donahue show because they wanted to boost up the sales again. Yeah. And so uh, Phil said to me, uh, you know, uh, you know how he sits on his day. How did you like? How did you like playing on Broadway? I said, well, actually, it's kind of boring, you know. <laughs> I did read about that. You say that. Can you imagine? Well, All of Broadway is like, excuse me? I was a little bored. <laughs> and everybody on the side is going. <laughs> <laughs> but I was telling the truth. I was kind of bored. I mean, I wanted to play. I wanted, I wanted to do some rock. I wanted yeah. to do rock. And I really wanted to sing like Grace Slick or, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. that was my idol. Um, and uh, uh, that was, yeah, so that didn't go well. I didn't do great interviews back then. Um, <laughs> I was a little too honest. But anyway, but you, you you did get bored with the role because I, I I read read that interview, and then the movie comes along and you have yeah. to do the role still. So how did you reinvigorate yourself to play the role, something that you were kind of bored with on the big screen? You're filming in Israel. Well, that's that's Norman it. it was a different medium, directing. different medium. So it's interesting again, right? You know, we're we're in a foreign country and and uh, everything is brand new. So it was it was great, and and I I, I learned a lot. You know, just by being around the film people, I mean, it's a whole different, you know, yeah. vocabulary. And uh, I, I, Norman Jewison, what, a, what, there couldn't be a better director to work with for your first time thing because he was just so patient and gentle and like your, it was like my dad, you know, he had that kind of voice and he just sort of patted your back and he just, he just made it, made it okay to be there. Not one nervous moment did I feel, um, but again, you know, it, when I, when it, when that was done, I. I told these writers who, uh, who wanted to record an album with me in England, and they were two writers, and they said, we want to do songs, we want to write songs for you that you're interested in. And I said, well, you know, I got kind of bored of doing the Mary Magdalene thing. I'm just, I want to break out of that, that mold, you know? So can you write songs about, you know, just debauchery, just songs that are kind of naughty and, and, and you know, kind of on the edge of, of, of bad, you know? <laughs> and so like, you know, I gave them some, some, some examples, like, it's like, like gluttony, you know, and lesbianism and, you know, just murder even, you know, just songs that I just can't uh, sing about, you know, uh, just sing about some other things. And so they wrote some great songs for me. And one of them was, I don't know how to love him blues. I love that. If you heard it, no, no, but well, like the yeah, 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 yeah. And so it was kind of bluesy, and it was I. I just don't want to sing. I don't know how to love him no more. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they got sued. Tim and Andrew sued them. <laughs> can you do that? Yeah, of course you can. Oh wow, Andrew so, loves suing people. He, don't you know it? <laughs> you better not say anything. Just say what's <laughs> no, next? No, he wouldn't let me do Mary Magdalene. I was I was um, offered to do, to, to do the role in in Italy when Ted Neely went over there, but because I have to sing it a little lower, I you know. This was twenty years. This was how long? Thirty years later, and I wasn't. I wasn't allowed to sing. I was married to somebody who did not want me to sing uh, for twenty years. Yeah. So I wasn't singing, and so the voice drops. Everything drops. Your boobs drop. Your ears drop. Everything drops, and the range dropped. Okay, what can I say? <laughs> and, and so uh, I wanted to sing it in the key of C rather than D. And no, it was a no go. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Um, now I think he's loosened up a little bit, but. Not really. Um, he's he's kind of tight on that because he said, you know, you, you you have to transpose from you have to segue from one thing to the next, and it's not going to sound right. Nobody's going to know, really. But he's a he's a perfectionist. I, I I I can I can, what I don't know. I guess I can. What's the word? Come on. What's the word? I can. What's the word, honey? Yeah. I can relate to that because yeah. I, I am too. Well, he let, he let Madonna drop the keys for Evita, so. He did? Yeah. I mean, she didn't just drop them. She dropped oh them to the floor. <laughs> like, don't cry for did me, Argentina. Really? Oh, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to go to the the, uh, the thing over there, the opening, but I, mi I missed it because I was on a flight from from where L.A. to, to Australia. That's where it was opening. And I was let off in, in Hawaii. Suddenly, I woke up in my parents' living room with my mom shoving this egg salad sandwich in my face going, hey, eat, eat. I'm going, what? And then later on, I found out that I was apparently being very bad on the plane. I was trying to feel up the stewardess or something. <laughs> Just playing around, you know. I was sitting next to somebody, and we were doing coke in the bathroom, uh, drinking, and, and uh, they threw me off the plane. My God. That was really something. It's like, <laughs> 
<laughs> These are rock and roll stories, <laughs> girl. <laughs> yeah. is, so, but I want to talk about that climate. You know, uh, you had your hits and it was the 70s. Is it, was it, was it drugs, sex and rock and roll like we think of that era? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sudi 54, all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was really born at the right time. I, I loved it. I don't think I would turn anything around or change anything. You know, uh, when, well, I wasn't really that bad until I met Eric. And that's when it got to be brandy in the morning, you know, for in your in your orange juice and that kind of thing. And you toured with, with, with oh, him. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I went down to um, Miami where he was recording after he got over the whole heroin thing. And, and so it, it was his sort of comeback album, I suppose. And so since my husband at the time was the president of RSO Records, we were a very small company. It was just the Bee Gees, Eric, myself, and this band named Player. And uh, so, you know, they uh, Bill was his name. Bill had to go down there and, you know, as representing the record company and everything. And so he took me along. I, he, he said, would you like to bring your guitar? I said, I'll bring both guitars. So I brought my, my 12 string and my six string. And uh, we went into the studio and to say hi to him. And he needed some, some help on I Shot the Sheriff. Right. And so he said, oh, you sing, don't you? I said, yeah, I do a little bit. <laughs> so I went in there and put the, I shot the sheriff on there. And he said, oh, that sounded great. And then there was another song he wrote that he needed a verse for. And, he, and I said, do you write? And I said, yeah, a little bit. You know? And so I had something already that I wrote for another song. And I put it in there. I never needed a run around, a run around dizzy hound checking out the bitches in heat. You got a lot of nerve dishing out what you serve waggling your piece of meat. <laughs> So, so we put that in a song, Get Ready, it was called. And so he liked that. And then I sang with him on uh, Hand Jive and a couple other things. And so I was, I mean, can you imagine? This is one of my idols. Yeah. And I got to be on his album. And that was, the, I mean, I couldn't ask for anything more. So I was back in New York just feeling so good about it, listening to the tracks all the time. And he calls up and he says, uh, uh, would you like to be in my band? I mean, think about it, honestly. Is there anybody that you loved? Well, suddenly they called you up and asked you to be in their band. What would you do? I'd pass out. <laughs> exactly. So I was wh- speechless. But what was life on the road with him like? I can't remember. Because <laughs> it was a big party. <laughs> it was. It sounds like a good party to me. <laughs> no, it was, it was great. It was great. I was on the stage. There were 40,000 people out there with their lighters, you know, and, and I, uh, everybody was, I mean, you know, so I'm sharing the stage kind of. I'm sort of to the right and to the back. But I, he, there was no, I think I was the first woman to ever be in his band, mm. his actual band. He had sung with Delaney and Bonnie, you know, but so I was the first woman in his band. That was pretty heavy. And, uh, but, you know, it wasn't enough for me. I, I used to play tambourines against my, against my jeans. And one night, I guess my skirt lifted up and, and some, and the drummer said, oh my God, look at your leg. You know, cause there was a white stripe going up my leg and every, on the other side of it was black and blue because of the tambourine hitting yeah. my leg. And so he said he he went out and bought me some gun holsters. So I had this, you know, the thing, gun holster, so I could whack it on that. But I had all these bullet places where you put the bullets, and so I would roll up twenty dollar bills, you know, and I'd stick them in there, you know. And when I when we'd sing, I'd throw them out to the audience, <laughs> like little coke tutors. <laughs> yeah. And then they couldn't understand why everybody was coming to my side of the stage. <laughs> well, we know now. <laughs> So what is your view on the music industry? You know, you were in, in, in it in s- such an exciting time. Um, you took time away, as we know, um, and then you came back uh, w- with your new album. But the whole industry has changed. How, From your view, how has it changed the most? Completely. I mean, I didn't want to leave. No, 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 no. I, I take that back. I did. I was getting, I was getting jaded. I was. I wasn't enjoying that. You know, that I, w- I tell you why. I was taken from Clapton's band. Robert Sigwood said, you've got, you've got a couple hits that are coming up the charts. You have to go out and you've got to promote them. You've got to get your own yeah. band. And so Eric said to me, he said, you're leaving the band. You're leaving the band. And he got very mad at me. And um, I said, I don't want to. You know, I cried and all that stuff. But I did. I had to leave the band. And I got my own band together. And it was, I mean, forget it. With Eric, it was like they got their own, they got their own train. When we would hook onto another train and, and we had our own, you know, cars and we traveled in, in eight, I mean, it was always first class because he wanted his band to be in first class with him all the time. So we went to Ibiza. I mean, we were on yachts. We went on everywhere. It was the, <laughs> I mean, talk about learning learning about things really quickly. I did. I, I, I got to learn the high life incredibly well. And then suddenly I'm taken down a step or two and I've got my own band and we're now on tour buses, right? Where we're playing little seedy places where the guitar player had to go on the steps, you know, down yeah. the, you know, uh, he wasn't on stage with me anymore. It, it was just really, it was great though, because it, I was doing my own music. Okay. So that's fine. But um, 
but I did miss I did miss the other the other thing the the big stadiums and all that. Um, but what what was the question? Well, no, it, no, it was that, and you know, the, the leaving the industry, but your view of the industry oh. and how, how it just really changed. And that well, road life know. is a tough life. What's the industry like now? I don't really know. I mean, I can't even relate to a lot of what I hear. I don't even know who's at the Grammys. I, I watch it and I go, who the heck are these people? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who they are. I didn't even know who Taylor Swift was until about a month ago. <laughs> I really, you know, until I started watching football. Then I knew about well, her. Well, now we all know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, you, you kind of develop, you know, I, I've developed a love for football because of, of my old man. I'm married to somebody who loves football. And now, you know, I'm, I'm right there with him, you know, cheering. So that's how I learned about Taylor Swift. I mean, I don't know about a lot of people in the, in the industry. And... And I wish I did. So I, the other night, you know, something came on TV. I said, honey, we've got to we've got to listen and watch this. We've got to know what's going on because it's all very interesting. It's all good. I would like to learn more about rap and hip hop. I mean, if I could just read the lyrics, you know, and see what they're saying, then I, I'd really like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I got to know what I'm listening to. I got to lyrics are important to me. They really are. That was fresh. <laughs> What was that period of time life when you returned to Hawaii and then you were like, you know, I, I'm, I'm really not going to be in this industry. I mean, that must have been a hard adjustment. Well, I was, li- you know, I was married to somebody who did not want me to sing. For 20 years, I didn't sing. That's insane I had, to me. I, I know, mean, well, he, he was jealous. You're like the voice of the 70s. He was, a, he was, a, he was jealous. He, well, he was also a musician and he didn't have the lucky breaks mm. I did. And so he was, you know, I, I, I had two babies from him and, uh, and I was a great cook. And so that's what made him happy having his babies and cooking for him. So he was this like gorgeous 175 pound Adonis, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna marry a schlump, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, but I cook so well, I bake so well. I got him back, I turned him into a 300 pound guy. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> No, no, that's mean. No, but no, that that just came part and parcel. That just came with it, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, I we were living in this derelict house because that's all we could. It was free. Uh, you know, times were hard. Times were hard. I remember pushing my babies along, you know, for a walk, and I'd try and see if I could find a diamond ring somewhere along a sidewalk somewhere that somebody dropped. You know, we needed money, and we ended up in this house in Malibu, not Malibu proper, but up in the hills, and. Uh, it's it's where there were no w- doors or windows. Coyotes and, and other animals had gone in there to, you know, s- spend the night. So we moved in there and we had to put up, you know, plastic sheets for the thing. And um, I was really at my wit's end. I got a call from Tom Moffat, who was one of the big promoters in Hawaii. He said, Yvonne, we miss you. I want to bring you over here. Just record one song and we'll just record, you know, we'll just release it in Hawaii. So I said, yes, he said, I'll pay your air for I said, I'm there. So I left my husband. My daughter was already at Stanford. Uh, my son was unfortunately had to stay with him, which is, was okay. That was his dad. But they they would spend the night in Oxnard, you know, in one of those little gardener shacks, and they'd go to the the the, the uh, club in the morning, the r- racquetball club, and they'd put tortillas in a in a in a some foil on their engine. And by the time they got to the place, it was hot. I mean, that's you know, <laughs> I found out about it later, and that's kind of that's kind of interesting. But um, it's it's not the way to live, really. Uh, so anyway, I. I I know what I'm saying, but I got kind of, I got off track. We so I was in Hawaii. I was I I, I was going to sing the song. I didn't really like it, and I just wanted to get there. Yeah. And my parents were getting older, and uh, they needed help. So it was perfect. I'm the only child, and so I ended up helping him. I met my my husband to be, but at the time he was just a friend. And he looked at me. He said, "Way, where's your guitar? Where sing, sing? What's the matter with you? You know." So I started singing with him, and we did we did something. We sounded sounded good together because he can also sing. And then I started to get interested in doing gigs. So I went to Japan. I went to different places, and I started to to involve myself again. And uh, it was it was a great it was a great feeling. I love it. It's hard to take a lot of the time when we do these screenings and people come up to you. This woman came up to me the other night and she cried her eyes out, put her hands on my shoulder. She said, I can't believe I'm touching Yvonne Elman, you know. And she said, you changed my life and my, I would have been nothing. And you made. And to hear that a lot is, is, it's hard. You don't know how to live up to it. You don't, you don't know what to say. After a while, you feel like you're not responding properly because you should. Re- and I'm very moved. But when you hear that again and again and again, yeah. you know, it's it's uh, you have to keep yourself in the moment and really think about what they're saying, because that's heavy. That is extremely heavy. But th- that is a lot of pressure. And so let's talk about the legacy of Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, 
you and Ted are selling out nights all over the place. Yeah. And it's fans that are coming. What is the allure of this film? What is the allure of, of you guys? What is it that people are responding to so much? I asked them that. Um, I asked them that. Nobody's really given me a definitive answer. They just said it's it's changed their lives. They have so many different answers. You know, they weren't they weren't religious. It had nothing to do with religion, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is it then? If it's not to do with religion, um, it's not to do with Jesus. You know, and they said it's your voice to me. Your voice is so beautiful and. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me feel so good. Yeah, but is that enough to change your life? Yes. Well, I, I was once asked to go to a hospital. A girl had been in a car accident, and they wanted me to come and, and hold her hand and be with her because she loved me. And so I went, and I, and I, you know, I sat with her, and she pulled out of it. And, and they, they gave me the credit for it. <laughs> and I didn't want anything to do with that because— That is a lot of a, pressure. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's almost a burden because yeah. if I could do it every time, then, hey, yeah, bring it on, but— because you walk away with that heaviness. Yeah, and she probably would have pulled through anyway, but but who knows, you know? So I gave her some kind of will to live, but really heavy, yeah. Well, from my mom's point of view, the music was so indicative of her life. And, you know, that period of time, the, the world was changing. Jesus Christ Superstar changed musical theater on Broadway in the same way that Hair did, you know, previously. But your music, you know, Saturday Night Fever, it's people remember where they were. They remember how their lives changed around that time. And your voice... Um, is a, a, it's a storytelling voice, and I think people are taken back to, to their memories. And you're just you hear your voice and sing. You know exactly who the singer is. You know exactly really? what you were doing is the first true? time you heard. Of course. Oh wow! No, yeah. I've always wanted to hear that about my voice. You know, because you know when Barbara's singing, you know when Liza's singing. Yeah, you know, 100%. You know, when Linda but it, it's that plaintive pathos that you have, but it's storytelling in in your voice too. Oh, wow. And I think that's what made I don't know how to love him uh, so popular because how many singers have we heard sing that? Over and over. Every audition you go to, it's over. And it's always so presentational and it's so musical theater right. But it doesn't have that feeling that, that you brought to it. And especially in the film, oh, wow. for that being your first film, and you were so sincere and approachable on the screen, like you felt like like we were there. Really? Yeah. And I think that's what people are responding well, to. Well, Norman was really responsible for a lot of that, too, because he would. He told me how to walk. You know, when you do the scene of the shawl and I, yeah. and I walk up that. Yeah. He told me. He said, do it like this. And he did the thing. And I, I copied him, you know, because <laughs> I didn't know how to walk like a prostitute. <laughs> We'll go in West Hollywood. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but what's it like revisiting a film? And when I saw the date, I couldn't believe 51 years. What's it like returning to the film over and over again when you think, you know, that <laughs> was oh, that was a long time ago? It was. Well, you know, I'm absolutely thrilled and grateful because I'm 72. How many people get to, you know, carry on doing what they're doing at this age when it's such a young business? You know, so I'm so grateful. I get to go all over the place and I get to meet great people that just stroke, you know, they blow smoke all day up your put, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you throwing them $20? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do give them the lights to turn on so they can read their yeah. menus good, you know. <laughs> I, do, I like to give, in Hawaii we give a lot of times, you know, yeah. you, 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 you give stuff in return and I am totally grateful. I, I love that, that, that Frank, you know, the... I don't know who came up with, with this idea. Did you, Frank? Yeah. You know, to go around. I mean, we do things like we go to someone's house for dinner. They've invited us over because they're a big fan. They invite their friends and they show that they, they screen, they, they give us dinner and then they show, they show the movie. And then if anybody's got a question, they say cut or hold it and yeah. they stop it and they ask the question we answer, you know? And so people don't get to do that when they just go see the movie or they're watching it in their own home. So we give them that personal thing. And, uh, you know, people call us back to, to come and sit in their homes. And that's that's really nice. That's really a lovely thing to be that to trust us that much and and want to and want to make us happy and, and feed us. I mean, really. Hey, I mean, it's not bad. eh? No. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, and joining forces again with Ted Neely. What was it like that first kind of rehearsal where you sat and jammed? I mean, you're talking about somebody you did a movie with 51 years ago, you know? I know, yeah. And Teddy's so easy to see. He's so easy to be around. And, you know, you ask him to, to harmonize something with you. He's right there. His voice is great. Yeah. I mean, he can still do the role. It, he's 80-something, yeah. okay? He can still hit those I notes. saw him in a production, I think it was probably maybe 20 years ago. But still, that was... So he's inspiring. 30s. He's inspiring. He's so good to... I mean, when the people stand in line and they wait to talk to him... It's sometimes after midnight. It can sometimes go to two, three in the morning. Yeah. He will answer the question that the last person in line 
asks him, and he will completely... Teddy doesn't talk uh, just quick lines. He tells the whole story. And he gives everybody the same amount of... See, I get this moment. The, the, the word just kind of goes... Whoosh. You know, it just leaves my brain. Because you've been talking to so many people for so many hours, for so many days. No, it's You're a like, senior moment. Let's I just want an egg salad sandwich <laughs> back in Hawaii <laughs> after a fun time in the air. <laughs> I want to hear that song. <laughs> I'll have to write it. Yeah, that's, I did write a song called Steady As You Go. And yeah, yeah, it's about that. It's about hold, yeah, put the reins on. Yeah, that was, uh, that was good. I did that. I, I don't think I'd change a thing, honestly, really. But I wish I could remember more of it because I could write quite a book. <laughs> that would be a page turner. <laughs> yes. What do you want people to most get from your m music? Well, I did come out with my own stuff. Uh, 2004, I recorded an album called Simple Needs. Yep. Yeah, and I just, it was it was everything. I, unfortunately, they sound like a bunch of songs that are scolding you, you know? Well, Simple Needs, it's just, well, let's live more simply. We don't need all this other stuff we have, you know? Let's, let's just, you know, so if you hear the song, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Steady As You Go was when I was, in Eric's band, and we were everybody was so drunk. It was like, you know, it, it got it got tiring. You know, we'd have incredible Bob Dylan. I remember sitting there in the room playing with Marcy, who was the other singer, and Bob Dylan runs in the room. First of all, a lady with one leg ran in the room, and she crawled out Wait, a window. She ran. Well, hopped on one leg, <laughs> and then she crawled out That's the window. That's another song. Hopped on one leg. <laughs> We're just, we're just pumping him out. <laughs> and, and he's chasing her. And so he comes in, and so instead of going out the window, he just sits down in front and goes, you're listening to what we're doing. And he goes, you're good, like that. He's got this handkerchief tied on on the four knots, on the four sides in knots, and he put over his head. Is that a sign? Is that a Monty Python kind of I thing? I have no clue what that is. <laughs> but, but he, Maybe he was like, ch channeling Mary Magdalene with his veil. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you take a handkerchief, you tie knots on four ends and you wear it anyway. So then he crawled out the window chasing her. He, he was into amputees at the time. Oh. You know, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Who knew that about Bob Dylan? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Things you don't know. <laughs> I know. But you know, I mean, the kind of life he's lived, you, you want to try a little bit of everything, right? So <laughs> I guess there's nothing left, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so why I said that is because I don't know why I said that. I, I just diverted you into that area. But well, th I, th this is just part of the whole culture, you know. <laughs> you know, hanging out with the Beatles, Bob Dylan, and and being part of theater and movie history. This is this is your life. Absolutely, and uh, what a life! I mean, really, what a life! I did. My husband and I, for the last two and a half years, had to hospice my mom, who was one hundred and three. Wow. And she passed on, but for two and a half years, we had to watch her, and she had dementia, and she was deaf, and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I mean, that's the first time I've had to really work, you know, and and <laughs> and take care of her, which was um, a wonderful thing, too, because I got to be with her so in so many ways that I never had before, and um, I was always told, you're such a wonderful daughter for doing that. Well, what else are you going to do? Of course yeah. you're going to. You know, maybe some people don't do it, but I'm an only child, and that was my responsibility. And so uh, we, uh, we, we're we enjoying going out now. Now we can go out together because before it was one person that always stay home. Yeah. And uh, now we can go out and be together. And the, our, our, greatest, our greatest sanity is our dog. Dogs give you great. I mean, he just brings it. love. And they bring you home each time. They, You know, you could be just pissed off. In fact, we'd get angry at each other. We'd yell or whatever. You'd start an argument, and he would just leave the room. And he was he would let us know this is no good. Yeah, you know, so we calm it ways. down. Come on, come on, you can yeah. come back. We're fine now. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, our dog, we're, we're simple livers. We live very simply. And uh, uh, of course, when we come in and we do this thing, we we live it up a bit. I mean, this is you know, we get we get to stay in hotel rooms and and, and use all the towels and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the questions I have is, you know, traveling all around. Are, are you tempted to, to to stick around and and or is, is Hawaii I will always going to be? Oh, I see. You move back? No, yeah. no, no. I mean, Hawaii is it? Yeah. I, I love it. It's it's where my skin is. You know, I wish it was a little bit cooler. But we have one room in the house that's air conditioned. That's my room. Although, you know, now we're going to go to Boston now, the end of uh, next month, and we're going to do songs that I've never done before on yeah. stage. That's exciting. Oh, it is. It is. I'm going to do I Can't Explain, which is what I did with Pete Townsend, you know. Uh, anyway, and, and Savannah, all kinds of songs I've never done before. And we've got a great band, terrific band, book, you know, playing with us. And I get to be on stage with my cane. I mean, I did fall and I broke my back and I've got a problem with my hip. 
but I get to be on stage. I'm trying to figure out wonderful things to do with my cane. You know, I'm going to... This cane is named... Ribbons. This cane is named Virgil. Okay. Why? Virgil Kane is my name. <laughs> you know, so that's Virgil. And then I've got Michael Kane at home. Michael Michael is a bit more elegant, right? Yes. And then I've got I've got cocaine. And that's the white... <laughs> That's the white one. <laughs> you, you could sell these canes. We're just going to have all these business That's ideas. That's what we'll do. That's yeah. what we'll do. Uh, but on the East Coast, on Tuesday, March 22nd, you're going to be in Arlington at yes. Regent Theater. Mm -hmm. And fans actually get to see a rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. That's so one night's fun. rehearsal. And then Thursday, March 28th is the concert. Right, right. Um, and then for Easter weekend, which is really fun, you're going March 30th uh, to East Greenwich to the Odium Theater yes. for a concert. And then... Uh, the next day, Easter Sunday, is actually a screening of the Sunday, film. Sunday, yeah, the screening yeah. of the film. I, and on in these concerts, I get to sing, you know, duets with Teddy. Yeah. We don't get to do that much, you know. On, on We haven't really on the screen. And so, and he's such a wonderful singer to sing with. Our voices blend well together. So there's a lot of good things and new things to, to, to see and hear uh, if y'all come out and see us, you know. We, we want to come out here, but we need a rich backer. We need somebody, that, you know, with lots of money to say, We'll pay for your way and we'll pay for your hotels and come on up. Pay well, for the band, you know. We put the word out there, so, you know. Oh, yeah. Thank yep. you so much. Yep. Yeah, Alexander, you're great. Yvonne, what's your message to your fans? Big mahalo for just, you know, for, for, for re reinvigorating me and for giving me a lot of encouragement. Mm. Um, I don't think I would have done it without that encouragement because who wants to be, you know, the has-been whatever that's 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 trying hard to sound like she did before that has to drop her her, her songs to to uh two notes <laughs> but uh uh yeah that's what it is it's it's people always say why, why aren't you doing anything and uh and they give me this love which you could live on it really yeah. you know and i thank them really from the bottom of my heart mahalo nui loa indeed well it's love much much deserved because like i said you know your your music uh has brought so many feelings and experiences so thank you thank you i'd like to know more about you Can oh girl that's a whole other story <laughs> That's a whole other show. Oh, you're very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, but you can get tickets at tednealy.com and it has all your schedule mm -hmm. um, there. Um, it's a great website to take a look at. And there's little behind the scenes pictures. Is that the, the camera right there? Yes. I've yeah. been looking. They've got this lousy profile. No. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Great <laughs> to see you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we snagged you while, while you were here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I no, the it. minute I saw that you were touring, I'm like, let's see when she's in Southern California. Thank you. 100%. 100%. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Uh, well, that's all, folks. It's always a grab bag of fun here and on the rocks. A big thank you to our engineer and studio owner, Tony Sweet, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Please like, share, subscribe so we can continue bringing this fabulous programming coming your way for free. And until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy. And if you drink, you have stay, a touch stay to drink. Tipsy. Can I have it? Yeah. <laughs> for the road. On Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.